And it's, it is amazing. And, you know, you know the old expression, you can line up every economist, you know, from here to the moon and still not reach a conclusion. But uh, rarely do we see such disparity in, in, in analyzing what this infrastructure plan uh, would do to GDP, job growth, um, everything else. What is your view from what you know? And obviously, we don't know what it's going to look like when it, it when and if it finally gets passed. But what's your view about how it would affect, uh, for example, GDP or job growth? Yeah, well, remember that the plan is a, a two trillion plus headline, but that's spread over eight years. So it's not it's not an immediate kick like the 1.9 trillion COVID relief bill, which is almost all going to be spent this year. So it's a much more drawn out affair uh, because infrastructure is slow. Right? Handing out cash to people is very easy and very quick, but infrastructure is a lot slower. So several hundred thousand jobs per year on a rolling eight year program seems to me to be about the right sort of magnitude. So. I don't have any disagreement with the idea that it might be five million ish in total, plus or minus quite a lot. I mean, at the moment, we don't have a bill. We just have a, we have a plan, but we don't have a bill. And of course, we don't at the moment even know whether the, the Senate parliamentarian will allow it to pass a reconciliation, in which case it probably will happen, or if she won't, in which case it's going to be much more difficult to pass it. So there's a lot more hurdles to go from a plan to actual job creation. But if it if it goes through as it's drafted roughly, then uh, yeah, several million jobs over the eight year period seems to be about right. And that would give a, a meaningful boost to GDP growth over that period, something like a half to 1% maybe per year, which is not trivial. When you spread it over over eight years, that's a lot more growth. That's a lot bigger economy at the end of the period than before. And of course, the other thing it does is infrastructure it makes it easier for private businesses who aren't necessarily involved in the infrastructure project to do business more efficiently because better roads means less travel time and quicker transportation and lower cost and all the rest of it. R&D investment, which is also part of the plan, means a better technology, a faster technology, faster innovation. There's a, there's a whole host of ways in which this would support the private sector beyond businesses which directly benefit from the infrastructure. And that bit's much more difficult to pin down. But it would be a positive. Well, well what about the other side? Ian, what about the... By definition, uh, you know, corporate profits were uh, were raised in one fell swoop when the corporate tax rate was dropped. When it goes back up, obviously, corporate profits uh, will be affected. Um, if you, we don't know all of the implications of the personal taxes, but try net net to add everything up and the effect that that will have on GDP. You still think net net it's going to be additive to GDP even with the tax increases? I do. I mean, the tax increase is a difficult one because, you know, we had the enormous corporate tax cut, which didn't generate any boost to capital spending. Of course, there's other stuff going on, but it's, it's very hard to see any positive impact from the cut in the corporate tax rate at, in, in the bill that was passed at the end of 2017, uh, which might, you know, as a, as a basic starting point, might suggest that if you just raise the corporate tax rate, it won't necessarily depress investment. But it might. I mean, we don't know. We, there hasn't been a meaningful increase in the corporate tax rate for a very long time. We don't have any sort of recent experience to go by. Uh, and if corporates uh, don't cut capital spending, they might have to reduce their distributions to shareholders, which means that shareholders might have to cut their own spending in turn. Um, but most shareholders are institutional rather than individual, so probably wouldn't be a massive difference. I think it would be naive uh, and really hopelessly optimistic to say there'd be no offsetting reduction in spending at all. I mean, I, you know, that might be the, at the extreme position of some people pushing the plan very hard, but I think that's probably unrealistic. But I still think that the net would be a positive. And of course, again, I, I come back to this point that once you've done this infrastructure spending, you have a much more uh, amenable framework across the country for business to be more efficient. You've got better roads and better bridges and better transportation and more R&D and all these things. I mean, there's no dispute that the U.S. national infrastructure is kind of an embarrassment. It's been crumbling for the last 30 years. The backlog of, of work that needs to be done is, is absolutely gigantic. And each of those failing bridges and, and clogged up roads is a hit to private sector productivity. So when you spend uh, some money to, to unfree those things and, and to repair them and to make traffic flow easier and all the rest of it, then you are helping private business as well, uh, again, recovering some of those losses from that gradual deterioration of the infrastructure over the past few decades. So I, I'm positive that it would be a, a net plus, but I, but I wouldn't be so, I think, so bullish as to argue that there wouldn't be any downside effects from the tax increases like that. That seems uh, quite a stretch. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.